If this is your first time here, welcome. Um, My name is Craig, and I am the community care pastor here at Sunnyside, and uh, I enjoy it very, very much. Uh, Today, we're going to start out uh, by uh, a little little object lesson. Uh, You know, I, I borrowed this idea... Because we have this wonderful pastor lady who is really good at object lessons. So this morning we have uh, three uh, jars on, on, on the table here. Just want you to take a look at them there for a minute. And uh, they're, they're ceramic jars. And they were uh, created. They were made. So um, tough question. Do you know what material was used to make these ceramic jars? What do they call it? They call it clay. And when you're making a ceramic jar, and I know there are people out here who know this stuff, how how are they made? Speak up, go ahead. You you throw the clay. You have to. Th- you, bake you bake it. What else? Glaze. You have to glaze it. You have to what? Mold it. You have to mold it unless you have a, a a mold that you just put the clay in. You have to mold it with your hands. That's right. Thank you. So uh, looking at these three uh, clay jars, these three jars of clay this morning. Um, how are they uh, similar? <laughs> Very good. They're made of clay. Just they're containers. They are containers. They are all containers. Good. I like that. Uh, I'll move on to the next question since uh, since we're uh, on a roll here. What is the intended purpose? of each of these clay jars. To hold stuff. To hold stuff. Okay? So, this might hold what? Tea, water. water. And it's used to be poured out into a cup. This one might be a little, little more challenging. It has, a, uh, it has an opening, good. Pencils, uh, could be used for a pen or pencil holder, could be used to put flowers in. I think that's pretty good. Anybody else? Perfume. Um, the, the opening here is a, is a little bit wide, but if there was a cork, certainly. All right. And uh, the last one over here. What do you think this one should be used for? Coffee Coffee filters. Coffee filters. Cookies. Stuff. What kind of stuff? Little odds and ends? Bobby pins? Safety pins? (laughs) Oh, good one, Barry. Okay. Yeah. Um... I, I guess it could be used for an urn. All right. So, um, we had some fun here. No, enough said. Um, this is part one of the message, Treasure in Jars of Clay. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we will begin with verse 7 and read through verse 18. Now, um, I just want to make you aware of one thing, and that is our focus today is the jars of clay. Okay? But we're going to read this entire passage because on another Sunday, uh, you will hear part 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 7, and this is the New International Version. 
And we just have verse 7 because that's kind of our focus for the screen, but I'm going to read all of the verses so you can be thinking about uh, what else is contained in God's Word. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is seen, unseen is eternal. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. But we have, we have, we have this treasure in jars of clay. He is the potter. He is the potter, and we are the clay. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, it says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 6, we see where Jeremiah was sent by God to the potter's house. And Jeremiah saw the potter at the wheel. And as he saw the potter at the wheel, he saw that the clay was marred. It was deformed. And he watched the potter form and shape the clay. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 18, which says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. So I just want to stop for a minute and recognize that he's the potter and we are the clay. But also the nation of Israel is the clay and he is the potter. I mean, just bear with me for a minute. What if you stuck into that passage of scripture? Can I not do with you, America, as this potter does? declares the Lord. I wonder if we took a, a survey by a show of hands, how many of us think that America needs the potter at the wheel? So when we're talking about jars of clay, 
We're not just talking about individual people. We're talking about nations. We're talking about entities. We're talking about the body of Christ. We are the clay and he is the potter. In Acts chapter 9, there was a guy named Ananias. And the Lord had told Ananias to take Saul, who was to be the apostle Paul, to take him in. And Ananias said, oh, wait a minute, Lord. Uh, I know this guy. Uh, he, he is a destruction machine. His mission and purpose is to wipe us Christians out. His mission and purpose is to destroy and jail those who are followers of the way. And the Lord said to, to Ananias, Saul is my chosen instrument. Before he was even saved or redeemed or encountered on the road to Damascus, God saw the clay and he, the potter, saw the possibilities. And Paul became a mighty man of God, a mighty warrior. And the church that he sought to persecute and destroy and Christians that he sought to jail, he began to work with. He began to teach with. He began to preach with. He began to plant churches. So there are no limits, folks, to what God can do with the clay. Because he is the potter and we are the clay. So ask yourself this question. What do we, what do I have in common with Paul or with the nation of Israel? Well, we're jars of clay. And we've been chosen. And each and every one of us has a planned purpose and use as the potter sees fit. Well, the treasure in the jars of clay is the message. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that God sees each one of us for our potential, who we are and who we can become, and he treasures us. He has given us value. He has created us in his image. In the book of Genesis, he made us from clay. And he formed and shaped. And he had a plan and intended purpose and use. And then sin messed it up. But God did not give in. God did not give up. He saw the potential. He saw the potential in Paul. He saw the potential in the nation of Israel who continually went astray. And he sees the potential in you and me. But the treasure is the message, not the vessel. The treasure is inside of the jar of clay, if you will. It has the most value and it has awesome and unlimitless power. It is the message of Christ crucified and risen from the dead. It is the message of Christ the victor, of Christ the king. It is the message of Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yet, God chooses to use a powerful message and demonstrate that powerful message in little old tiny jars of clay. commentator, a Beacon Bible commentary, Dr. Frank Carver writes this about this particular verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. The illusion may be to an earthen jar in which 
Precious treasures were often hidden. Or a small but inexpensive pottery lamp that can bring light in the darkness. You see, we are the handiwork of the potter. And he has a calling and a purpose for each of us. And his treasure is in the jar of clay. The cross of Christ. The gospel of Christ. Crucified, risen, and victor over the dead. And Lord of lords and King of kings. And he wants to use you and me as his clay. He made us in his image. You are who you are by design. You are wired the way you are wired because God planned and intended for you to be wired that way. There is value in every jar of clay, regardless of the cracks regardless of if it's been broken or shattered. Because he is the potter and we are the clay. He is the only one who can give us new life, new opportunity, a do-over, if you will. Anybody in here need a do-over? When he redeems us, he has something in mind. Yes, that we would be a demonstration of his power and the treasure of his message in a jar of clay. He forms and shapes our lives. He has a plan. And one of that primary reasons or purposes is to let the world know of his love to let the world know that they don't have to live with a cracked jar or a shattered life or a broken heart. I want to ask you a question. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy to be used by God as a jar of clay. Not one. Until the potter's hand goes to work at the wheel. When he redeems us, he wants to use us. He wants to mold us and shape us. And what he does when he takes that jar of clay is... First of all, he sets it apart and says, there is going to be a significant, whether it be great or small, big or little, regardless, it will have power and it will share that message that I want to share with the world. It will be a testimony of my power and my work and my ability to redeem and to forgive and change hearts and lives. So he sets us apart. He cleanses us. And he places within us his treasure. And then he calls us to be used for the purpose with which we are created. David Guzik says it this way and I love it. God chooses to put his light and his glory into everyday dishes. The treasure in a jar jar of clay ultimately brings glory to God and honors the potter who formed it. The most appealing demonstrations of God's power 
doesn't need to look like the fine china on display in the china cabinet. Oh, don't touch it. You might break it. The truth is, jars of clay are fairly common. Some of them are broken and have to be repaired. Some of them are cracked and have to be reshaped. And again, the commentator that I, uh, wrote this, I just love it, writes this. There are certain fragrances. There are certain reflections of the light and glory of God that can only be released through a broken clay jar. I read a story in Nazarene Compassion magazine that, that touched my heart. I'm not going to read the whole story to you, but I'm going to summarize it. Uh, there's there's a, an organization, a ministry, connected to the Church of the Nazarene in Chile, and the name of that organization is Marada de Amor. And what Marada de Amor means is the look of love or the appearance of love. Now, there were these two Christian businessmen who I believe were also Nazarenes, and they were looking away for a way to use their business and still minister to others and to their community. And these two Christian businessmen owned a restaurant called Baron Garden Cafeteria. And so what happened is they teamed up with Marada de Amor. Now, Marada de Amor is a development center for children, teens, and adults with disabilities. And these people at Marada de Amor who have disabilities don't qualify for government assistance. So you can imagine what their income might look like. And at Marada de Amor, they are taught life skills, including education, financial management, and are given job skills training tailored to their potential and to their abilities. In summary, Baron Garden began training and hiring students from Marada de Amor to work in their restaurant. Now there's, um, I think about a dozen at this point. It doesn't seem like very many people, but to that dozen, it makes all the difference in the world. Because, for example, Tomas, Tomas was the first employee hired by Baron Garden Cafeteria from Marada de Amor. And Tomas has Down's syndrome. And since he went into job skills training and began actually putting that job skills training into practice at Marada, at Baron Garden rather, he began to learn, he began to grow, he began to work independently, and his confidence and his countenance completely changed. His parents were amazed. He had a little independence. He was using skills that he had been taught. That jar of clay being molded and shaped by the Lord through some of his people. And the restaurant owner said this, not only about Tomas, but about other employees who are from Marada de Amor. Customers ask to be served by certain students that they have built a relationship with, and the other employees of Baron Garden have experienced an incredible amount of joy from building relationships with these students from Marada de Amor as well. 
In fact, one of them named Robs Robinson, who was an employee at Barron Garden and not a participant of Murata de Amor, but a trainer of someone from Murata de Amor, says this, I feel blessed to be able to share and guide our new co-workers in this process of meeting and learning about working in a place that serves people. And then he says this, I love it. They infect us with their willingness, joy, and excellent work, many times better than what a person without a disability can offer. Hmm. And then Joanne, another employee, who's a little more theological in her thinking, says this about this relationship between Murata de Amor and Barron Garden Cafeteria. She says, the church is more than a place where souls are restored. The church is also called to give light in the communities where it sits, to bring quality of life and dignity to those who have been discriminated against for years. So I just want to say, if you're a jar of clay and God has a purpose and a plan for your life and for you to carry his treasure not only in your heart but to others in the community. Think about those jars of clay with handicap, limited income, little prospect of having any support from the government whatsoever. And so, what happens? Well, that makes it challenging to pay rent. That makes it challenging to put food on the table. But because there were some vessels, some jars of clay, who were Christian businessmen and said, we want to do something for uh, our community, and we want to do something for those who are disadvantaged in our community. You see what happens when you allow the Father to mold and shape your life? He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a use for you. His treasure is in you and you and you and you and me. And he wants to use us as his jars of clay that bring glory. Even the cracks can reflect the light of his glory. I close with a quote from Oswald Chambers. And as I'm reading this quote, I'm just going to tell you that um, prepare your heart and your mind for communion and reflect on your jar of clay and how God is molding and shaping or has molded and shaped you thus far. Oswald Chambers writes, Ever since we had the vision, God has been at work getting us into the shape of the ideal. And over and over again, we escape from his hand and try to batter ourselves into our own shape. The vision is not a castle in the air, but a vision of what God wants you to be. Let him put you to the wheel and whirl you as he likes. And as sure as God is God and you are you, you will turn out exactly in accordance with the vision and the purpose of the potter in his hands. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Craig. <clears throat> Anybody here feel like a perfectly shaped jar yet? I know, I feel like my jar has some work that the Lord still has to do, and I'm so grateful for that process that he puts us through, aren't we? Well, we're going to go into communion uh, time, and um, 
Yeah, um, I just gonna have a few minutes to to um, prepare our hearts for communion, and usually we would go into a time of personal confession between the um, the Lord and us. And Barry, would you turn the lights down a little bit? Would you be? Are you, can you do that? You can't press a button. Yeah, there we go. Just want you to um, just take a minute, and just spend um, a little time with the Lord, and uh, I'm gonna read a passage from Psalm 32. And I just want you to reflect on it and then um, talk to God a little bit. Psalm 32 says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All guilt is gone. So, Lord, thank you that you are still shaping us and molding us. Thank you that you have put your spirit in us as jars, that we hold your holy presence within us. And Lord, I thank you for the gift of confession, that we don't have to let our guilt or shame or sin eat us up. Thank you, Lord, that we come to you, and we um, you make it like our guilt our record of the things that we don't really want people know to know about us is removed. So, Lord, we come to you and in um, and some silent confession before you. Is our heart right? Oh, we want, don't want to go into conv- into communion without a heart cleansed and right before the Lord. And that's his doing. He makes our hearts right. So, Lord, we want to confess now any unforgiveness. Lord, we want to confess bef- before you our secret sin, the things that we are hold very, very private, that we don't really want others to know about. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are so willing to put your beauty in us. You are so willing to take away all the stuff that would harm us to keep holding on to. Thank you, Lord, that... I look out into this church body and I see transformed lives. Thank you for transforming us. Thank you for taking us as cracked pots and putting yourself in and and filling in all the little holes and the nooks and crannies that you make us useful. Amen. So I'm going to give you um, just a chance to, um, there's elements here, communion elements on this side. You can turn the lights back up, please. Um, there's community and elements over here. I'm just going to have this half go ahead and grab elements and this half go and grab from over there. And then we're just going to um, sit for a minute and, and um, have communion together. So go ahead and get up. And um, as you're doing this, let's just sing a song. I mean, this is sort of just like kind of put in my mind this morning. So I didn't have a chance to like ask Carrie to play his guitar or anything. But we're just going to sing together. And if you know this song, go ahead and sing it. And if you don't know it, just as we're getting our communion elements, just um, you can just listen to the to the words. But we're gonna sing "Give Thanks." 
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the poor say I am rich. Oopsie, you encrypted. Let the poor say I am weak because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. If somebody wouldn't mind, Barry, will you bring me some communion elements when you come through? Would you bring me some? Thank you. <clears throat> so now I'm just going to give you some time as um, people are making their way back to their seats, just to actually think of what you're, th what you're thankful for. What are you thankful for? What has the Lord done for you that you are thankful for? Not five years ago, which you can still be thankful for that, but today, this week, right now. What is the Lord doing for you right now that you're thankful for? Thank you. Thanks. Anyone who want to just speak it out, something you're thankful for? Health, good health, you know? I know that there's people in this room and people watching online that aren't in good health, and they're really recognizing the fact that they've just taken it for granted, so thank you for saying that. Restoration, yeah. It's the restorer of our souls. Your life back, amen. This is a transformed life. Still going through the transformation, still painful at times, right? His forgiveness and his love, yep. I'm thankful for this church body. I'm thankful that we have a country that we can go freely and worship the Lord. I'm thankful for each of you. That I know that so many of you are just very servant-hearted, just very desiring to serve the Lord. So I'm thankful for you guys. So on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and said, this is my body being broken for you. So do this in remembrance of me. So take and eat the bread. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of my blood, the cup of the new covenant. Drink this in remembrance of me and your sins. Think of me and your sins will be forgiven. So Lord, thank you that you forgive our sins. Jesus, let us not take for granted the cleansing that you do in each of us. Some of us are resistant to it. And sometimes we don't even want to admit our stuff that, uh, sometimes we don't even want to admit our stuff. And uh, Lord, uh, I just thank you that you give us the opportunity and you just don't give up on us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Why don't you stand with us, please? And as we sing, blessed be your name.
blessing over you and you want to receive the blessing, right? This is from Ephesians. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people do, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of love and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You guys have a great Sunday. Love you. Thanks for being here. And thanks for putting up with me singing the wrong lyrics in that rotten song. All right? Thanks.